going here. Thanks for everybody coming out. This uh, I've been told is the largest audience so far. So, but I mean, I can tell you that, and you would know. <laughs> you have been here before, so well, welcome. I'm glad you're here. Uh, I'm, I don't tend to, to ramble on about this, so there's there's some stuff that you'll see up there, and, and uh, I may pop through it real quickly. But uh, if you think you'd like to more, know more about what I just ran through and didn't spend much time on, just jot a note, middle or other. And there'll be some time at the end to uh, to field any questions you, you have here. So um, I got involved in orthopedics about uh, 20 years ago. Um, during medical school. Really, I, I grew up as a missionary kid in Central America around a medical mission field. So I always wanted to do something medically, and then I was interested in the, the surgical arts and those kind of things. Um, spent some time in high school. Boy, things have really changed. In, in high school, I got to go in on an open heart surgery case and hold a retractor while they had this guy's chest cracked open. Uh, I don't know if you can say that. I think probably. They probably in the heart building want you to say that you know more technically, but I'm a bone doctor, so. But anyway, you know, you've got to sign so many forms now just to have anybody in the OR. So, and I understand the reasons for that, but uh, you know, I think they're limiting a lot of uh, ways to expand. You know, younger people to kind of see and decide what they want to do. But the thing I liked in the third year of uh, medical school was that I did an orthopedic rotation as one of the elective rotations in surgery. And uh, actually, I remember right now, we were doing a, a, a knee replacement, first one I'd ever seen. And uh, they got all the parts in, except for the last bit that was um, uh, the plastic insert that goes in there. And took, he put it in there, and he let me hit the hammer to knock it in. It made this nice little click. And I thought, this, this looks like fun. We can do this. Uh, so I think that, you know, I like to think about things mechanically. It seems to make sense to me. Um, so that's one thing I like about it. But uh, the other is, for the most part, the, uh, the patients that I get to take care of, uh, while they may have some other chronic medical issues uh, that are a part of who that patient is, you know, the reason they're seeing me is to get back doing the things that they, they want to do. Uh, most of my patients are not very sedentary. Um, and, and that's gratifying for me. And so I, I really enjoy seeing a patient that uh, comes in and, and sees me. They, they feel better when they're done, and, and, and uh, they, they go out. A lot of times, you know, on joint replacements, I'll see patients uh, at a year and then three years and kind of monitor those because we want to see if there's any changes. But for the most part, once that's done and rehab's done, you, you move on down, move on down the road. Um, and so it, it's gratifying, I think, from both both sides of things. So that's kind of what drives me. About uh, four years ago, um, I got interested in, you know, I would open up these knee replacements, uh, knees for knee replacement, and uh, a lot of the knee really wouldn't look too bad. Uh, but one specific part of the knee was worn out, um, and it was the front and inside. And uh, patients that I see for this solution, particularly, I'll just ask them where their knee hurts. And, you know, nine times out of ten, they'll take their index finger and they'll just point right to the inside part of the knee. Um, and that uh, is specific to this type of wear. And so, you know, we'll talk a little bit about joint replacement in general, but this is this talk tonight um, is uh, to answer certain questions about, you know, does every knee that has arthritis that has failed conservative management, including oral medications, injections, therapy, those kind of things which are very important to work all the way through, as we'll see, uh, do those, do all of those have to have the full knee replaced? And so this is one alternative to uh, total knee replacement uh, that, uh, that I've used in my practice over the last uh, three years. So there are, we use the term arthritis. Uh, anytime you see a word with the I-T-I-S at the end, that's itis, it's, itis just means inflammation. So if your bursa is inflamed, we call that bursitis. Yeah, it's, it's, it's bone and joint surgery, it's not brain surgery. <laughs> if your tendon is sore and inflamed, it's called tendonitis. Yeah. Okay. So when a joint is sore, it's called jointitis, right? <laughs> but if you want to get paid for it, it's called arthritis. So arthro is just Greek. Uh, for joint. So 
It's not specific to the type, but arthritis, there are a couple different types. Uh, the most common is osteoarthritis, which we'll be discussing tonight, but that's generally called wear and tear arthritis. It's price will pay for living on a planet with gravity. Rheumatoid arthritis and juvenile type arthritis are arthritic conditions in which the body, for some reason or another, begins to attack itself. Um, and then the joint lining gets inflamed and it tears down the uh, cartilage in the knee and that causes joint destruction as well. But osteoarthritis is the most common. 27 million Americans are affected with that and this is the wear and tear type. So it's a disease um, that's really not really a normal part of aging. I'll see some patients with uh, uh, pretty good looking knees. Actually, I saw one uh, up in my Lindell office uh, yesterday, uh, 73 years old, has probably a better knee on x-ray than I do. Um, and so a big part of this, like almost any other uh, disease entity we deal with, there's a, a portion of that that is, has some genetic uh, components to it. So it's kind of the way you deal with cards sometimes uh, helps you out or doesn't. But it mostly affects knees, hips, and interestingly hands. You know, it's, it makes sense that the knees and hips would be affected because we walk around that way. But I guess if you walk on your hands, it affects your hands. No, they, we use our hands a lot. And so the wear and tear type, you're going to have a lot of force generated with grip and those kind of things. And it's, it's routinely the interphalangeal joints out in, in, in after age 55, uh, osteoarthritis is more common in women, and so uh, if you're suffering with osteoarthritis, these are not uh, unfamiliar territories to you, but obviously we think of pain with arthritis. But uh, after laying around at night, if you've been fortunate enough to get some sleep with arthritis, uh, you, your joints may be swollen and stiff in the morning. These usually limber up as you move through the day because there's kind of a pumping mechanism that kind of shrinks the swelling there. But uh, with that inflammation, or the itis part of that, you may get a warmth because that's blood flow going to areas of inflammation. Um, and some people talk about creaking and grinding, so arthritic knees can become moist. So I started off just touching off on these, but there are different ways to, to treat arthritis. Surgery is going to be the is going to be the option of last resort. Um, but medications, and I like to start with just over the counter. What I tell patients in the office is the nice thing about Tylenol, Advil, Motrin, Aleve, those are the kind of things that you can take as directed. Um, you don't have to call your doctor to get a refill on those. Um, you have to kind of monitor those. And there are some people who should and shouldn't take those, and your primary care physician probably will talk about that. Physical therapy. I hear a lot, you know, I want to do physical therapy, but it actually seems to make my joint hurt more. Um, and that's not uncommon when you get started, but, but uh, we'll see here in a minute that one of my favorite things to say is motion is lotion. If you're moving, that keeps the joints lubricated. And then weight loss, we'll touch on that. Uh, that kind of makes sense, but I'll give you kind of a key thought that may, may encourage you in that. And then assistive devices for, for important reasons, canes, walkers, those kind of things. Although we sometimes don't like to use those just because of the way it looks, that's understandable. There are good reasons other than just how it looks to use it. And then as we get more invasive, we'll talk about injections. And then finally, there are different ways to, uh, to uh, treat these surgically. So over-the-counter, which is what OTC stands for, over-the-counter, I mentioned Aleve, Advil, Tylenol, Motrin, different drug classes, they work in different ways. Tylenol is uh, routinely, most of the metabolite is excreted through your liver, so it's kind of really our last kind of thing to offer people if they have significant kidney disease and can't take those other medications. Uh, when those fail, along with the other uh, modalities, we'll, we can do prescription medications. Uh, naproxen, which is a prescriptive dose of the Aleve, uh, Relafin, which is uh, the Bumatone, Mobic, and there's Celebrex. So all of these are kind of, this, this row here is non-specific anti-inflammatory medicines. It's basically just going out there and trying to knock down all the inflammation. Um, it's a, because they're not specific, they're usually a little bit cheaper, uh, but there's, they're not as specific and so they can cause a lot more GI upset and cause problems like that. That's why medications uh, like uh, Celebrex is, has been designed. And those are given with a uh, specific um, area to attack and what we call the inflammatory cascade. It's kind of technical talk, but there's, part, there's different chemicals in your body that get released when there's uh, insult, injury, arthritis is one of those, and so what this medication does is go and actually block that chemical from attacking in uh, the joint, and the, so that decreases inflammation, and so you feel like uh, your, your knee feels better. The arthritis is still there, but it's kind of masking. And then there are topical gels like uh, a Voltaren gel, like Clofenac is the uh, 
prescriptive name for it. So here it is. Physical therapy is important because motion is lotion. If you move it, you'll lose it. So move it, don't lose it. And then I like to say PT is the key. So you got to basically keep moving. It does a lot of things for you. It maintains flexibility. A joint that is more flexible and strong, even if it has arthritis, it makes sense. It's going to be going to feel better than one that's stiff and weak. And if you end up needing to have surgery, it's going to be a lot easier for you to rehab a knee that is stronger and already more flexible. Because certainly with uh, joint replacement, total joint uh, replacement, or replace the whole knee in general, you know, the knee motion you have before surgery is pretty indicative of what you can probably get afterwards. And oftentimes that's because of the big bone spurs back there mechanically blocking motion in the knee. You just can't bend it. Well, whenever I replace the knee, I get all that motion back. I'll get it back where you can touch your backside with your, your leg, get your leg all the way up straight, we straighten up the bent knee, but we do that over about the course of an hour, your muscles don't realize what's happened to them, and so they haven't been able to slide that far in that time, so it really takes a lot of work to gain all of the advantages that we get in a quick operation. So about weight loss, you know, the pain with osteoarthritis, a lot of it just is a physics problem, you know, it's the amount of weight per square area. Um, so it's easy for me to see a heavier patient say, hey, you just need to lose weight. And I know that's an easy thing to say, but uh, what I try to encourage people to doing is not losing a lot of weight real quickly. First of all, I think we've all tried to do that, and that doesn't last very long. Um, it's usually a lot of that's water weight, and uh, we really haven't changed who we are or our metabolism. And so what I do is tell patients to really aim for losing a pound every two weeks. And if you do that, you're going to lose about 25 pounds in a year. You think, man, I need to lose 50 maybe. Well, that, that may be true, but if, if you lose just one pound, your knees actually feel like you lose five. So over that year, your knees are going to feel like you lost 100 pounds. Or more, and that's going to make a significant difference. And the patients that I've had that have actually done that have been able to lay, or some of them still haven't had their knees replaced just because they've got the weight on. There are different assistive devices. Bracing. Bracing is great because it can offload the knee and move your knee to positions where it's off of the area that hurts. But the only problem with bracing is what? It's temporary. You only It only works if it's on. Yeah. And that's great when weather's like this. But in about another, probably tomorrow, but in a couple of weeks, it's going to be 100 degrees. Uh, and that's not very comfortable in, in Texas. Uh, but it is a cert it is certainly a way and an option that I give patients um, for uh, knee arthritis. Canes um, and walkers, you know, they, they're, they're cumbersome. It's also something that only works if you have it with you. But what we have found is that over the age of 65, the number one cause of hip fracture in patients is osteoarthritis. And secondary to that is going to be the balance. But it's not... The, the arthritis itself, but we've all walked around and tripped, you know, trip, you reach out and catch yourself. Well, if you've got a bad hip or a bad knee, it hurts to move it, your body has really already told it, we're not doing anything fast because it hurts when we do it, okay? I can get around slow, I'm okay, but when you trip and catch your toe, you're, you're going to want to throw that out there and you're just not going to get there and that's when you fall. And so, without those, then you're kind of sitting down this way. Right, and uh, unless you have the life alert, you know, I don't think we're sponsored by them, are we? All right, forget what I said. <laughs> I'll only work on physical. Okay. Different types of injections. There are two major types: steroids, which we've all heard of, uh, cortisone shots. You know, football knees. You can come in half time. No one really does that. Well, I guess if you're getting paid a million dollars a game, you probably would. But. Basically, this is a big anti-inflammatory, just like the oral medications we were talking about. But this injection goes right into the knee. So it's a great fast-acting pain relief. I usually tell patients it's going to take 48, 72 hours for that to start helping. So I mix it with a little numbing medicine. And patients oftentimes will feel better as, as they leave the office. Um, and so that's the one that's most common. I don't repeat any type of injection closer to six months apart because I think that self-feeding, um, if that's not taken care of it, then we're missing the boat. We need to look for something else as a cause or a solution to the problem. So that kind of puts people in mind sometimes. They think, yeah, my knee hurts. The injection lasts three or four months, but I don't want to really have my knee replaced yet. Is there anything else we can do? Well, there's another class of injection that's called uh, visto supplementation, which you may have heard of, rooster comb or something like that. Basically, those are just collagen that's been uh, manufactured and broken down. Really, what that does 
is it tries to trick the lining of the knee. That's that lining that gets inflamed, whether it's from osteoarthritis, wear and tear arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis. That's, that's where a lot of that pain comes from, the swelling or the itis in the lining of the knee. And so this can take a little bit longer to get started, but sometimes it can last longer because it really tries to genetically change the type of fluid that the lining of the knee makes. The problem with that arthritic fluid is it's very acidic and it goes ahead and breaks down more cartilage. And so you can have a knee that's inflamed and stiff um, and you can inject a steroid and that will knock that down. But when the uh, inflammation and arthritic fluid comes back, it just continues to break down cartilage and you get in this, this uh, vicious cycle. Uh, so these two, uh, I, I sometimes have patients that I will inject every three months, but we'll just kind of leapfrog the type of injection that we want. So I'm not doing any of them closer to six months, but we're trying everything we can do to prevent uh, surgery. <laughs> but when those don't work, the therapy, weight loss, medications, injections, then I basically have a conversation uh, with you and we say, you know, you basically have, you have a couple choices. Um, you can live with it like it is, and that, that's fine, because uh, some of you are my patients. You've heard me say there's only two of us in this room, and it really only hurts one of us. Uh, but So it really is up to you. But if it still bothers you, then that's something we need to be a little bit more aggressive about. And there are a couple different routes. There are arthroscopic surgeries, which are day surgeries. Really very little type of rehab involved. It's really just a clean-out surgery. And so... Um, <clears throat> You really the only, the only indications for doing that in the setting of osteoarthritis or wear and tear arthritis is when you have a mechanical symptom, something that's catching in your knee, that's not letting it go through the normal range. You just go in, just kind of wash and clean out the knee, you'll get kind of a placebo effect from that. It'll feel good for a couple of weeks, six, eight, twelve or so. But by but then the knee starts to make that inflammatory fluid again. So really the only indication in the setting of arthritis, radiographically or otherwise proved. Is, is if you have a mechanical symptom, either a flap of cartilage or the meniscus, which is the shock absorber cartilage in the knee that's torn, getting in the way of normal motion. If you clean those out, that can cause normal motion to return to the knee, and then you're not getting repetitive inflammation in the knee. And again, it's that inflammatory fluid that, that causes arthritis to accelerate, but also can cause uh, just generalized the joint stiffness. Okay. And then joint replacement, which uh, requires a longer hospital stay, sometimes two up to four days. Um, uh, and then formal rehab is usually six to eight weeks. I'll tell people in general it's on a bell curve. By six or eight weeks after a knee replacement, people are basically back to doing the things they need and want to do. Some people are quicker, some people take longer. But uh, I tell patients it can take a year to get over that. It's, it's not your knee. The best one you had is the one that you came in the world with. We're trying to get rid of pain and reestablish function. And so a joint, total joint replacement removes the whole arthritic joint. So these are some pictures of an arthroscopy. And, and over here, this is basically a schematic of what we do. It's two small incisions in front of the knee. We put an arthroscope, which is a small camera, a little thinner than a pencil. And through another incision, we have small little uh, scissors and shavers that, that clean out uh, the roughened area of the joint. So these are just different views. This is underneath the kneecap, as we're looking here. You can see here's the end of the femur. That's basically in this area here. And there's a loose piece of cartilage floating through there. This is a tear in the meniscus. The meniscus is this blue tissue here. And as you can see, if you, if you were to stand up, that could potentially get pinched between the knee. That, that's attached to the capsule. The meniscus itself doesn't have any blood flow or nerve to it, but it sure does where it's attached to the side of the knee. And that's when that catches, that pulls on your knee. And that's, uh, if anybody's had that, they can attest that when you twist and that catches, that gets your attention. This is the anterior cruciate ligament. You can see it here. That's the one that the football players tear. We have to reconstruct. Or if you're Jerry Rice, you have to reconstruct it four times. <laughs> um, anyway, so that's that's what we do at arthroscopy. So uh, there's limitations what we can do to the small instruments, uh, but oftentimes it can uh, relieve pain from mechanical symptoms. It's kind of a graphic picture here, but uh, this is a joint replacement. It's a little bit bigger incision than those ones we're using for arthroscopy. But basically what we do is we shave off just the end of the bone. So we don't lock you off here and here, but we do shave the arthritic portions off uh, of the end of the femur and the tibia, because that's where the joint line is. And then we replace that by capping the end of the bone with a metal implant, the top of the tibia with an implant, and then these plastic bearings uh, come in, and this, you replace the back of the kneecap as well. So as an aside, some people say if I've had my knee replaced, I can't kneel or squat on it. Um, I, I really don't know where that all began. 
Um, as long as you're not doing high impact activities, I, I tell my patients, you know, you can, certainly we did it so you can get back, go hiking, climbing ladders, those kind of things. You can crawl through the garden if you want. Uh, we just don't want high impact jumping kind of activities because it is an interface uh, between the bone and the metal. You can see maybe a little shadow here, maybe a little hard to see in the back of it, but that's the cement that we cement the implants into. You can kind of see it shadow here. So, is there another surgical alternative? You sure are hoping so because you've been sitting here for 20 minutes. <laughs> so replace only the parts of the knee that are worn out. So an analogy I like to use: if, uh, if your bathroom needs updating, don't tear down the whole house. Okay. So this is what we do for a complete replacement. You can see over here, you have bone-on-bone -bone changes all along the inside of the knee and outside of the knee. It's almost hard to tell where one bone starts and one bone ends. And so that's when we do a, a full knee replacement: replace the femur and the tibia. In this case, when you have wear isolate just the inside, that's pretty severe arthritis on the on the inside here. But the outside really is, is wide open. That's a candidate who might do well with just replacing the inside half of the knee here. Okay? So you can see once we replace that, the outside is still well maintained. Can you see it? <laughs> kick me or have him kick me if I get it. Good. So who gets which one? A total knee replacement? Again. To remind you what the x-ray showed, you know, if all parts of the joint are worn out, replacing only one part is probably not going to do a good job. You can't do a partial knee replacement if there's inflammatory arthritis, because again, remember, that affects the whole knee too, and you can get wear on the other parts, even if it looks good on x-ray. And then if you're stuck in so much bow leg position that we can't just straighten it out in the office, then that ligament's going to be too contracted for us to straighten your knee out and put a spacer inside. So basically, patients who don't meet those criteria uh, might be a uh, candidate for a partial knee replacement. Those are for isolated disease along the inside of the knee, uh, wear and tear type of arthritis, again, not inflammatory or rheumatoid, and that we can correct that bow leg deformity and that their ligaments are stable. We showed you that picture, the ACL ligament. I mentioned Jerry Rice tore that a bunch of times. Well, that one is very important. That ligament being intact and not having been injured is important because that keeps the knee rotating on a pivot. Okay, if that one's gone, that's when you get, this is a good East Texas term, wallering around <laughs> of that knee. Okay, and then that's where you get wear all across the knee, back and forth and side to side. So it's not a balance. But when that anterior fusion ligament's intact, you get that pivoting, and it's a very distinct wear when you open the knee up. It's worn right on the front of the tibia, anteriorly and on the inside, so it's called anterior and medial arthritis and just in the mid-flexion portion of the knee uh, on the end of the femur. So again, this is uh, isolated arthritis on the right side and left side shows you all of that. So what we do is we do a, a correctable x-ray. When we're under fluoroscopy, we, we try to see if we can correct that knee alignment. And what we want to see is that yeah, we correct it. It's not, any, it's not bone on bone anymore. See all the space over here? But almost as importantly, the space over here maintains the same relationship. What that tells us is that I'm stressing this knee, and it's causing a fulcrum on intact normal cartilage on the outside of the knee. If we were to do this, and this collapses all the way down, then we know that the reason that this is not showing is you just have so much bow leg that you're not even using that side of your knee, but it's worn out as well. So uh, we need to have intact ligaments, and this needs to be able to be corrected. Okay. So the implant that I use is, uh, and this is probably it's probably 36 year anniversary now, but it's the most widely used in clinically proven partial knee system in the world. At 10 years, 94% uh, of those are going to still be um, in, intact if they've been implanted for those reasons. So that's why I use very narrow clinical indications for that. And there are probably still some knees that I schedule for a knee replacement and get in and think, well, I wonder whether we could have done done that on, on this patient. Uh, 15 years, it drops a percentage, and at 20 years, uh, just over 9 out of 10 uh, should be intact. Okay, And so that, that matches or exceeds total joint replacements, but it has to be held to the uh, narrow indications. What's interesting is if you meet those criteria I talked about, intact ligaments, corrective deformity, it's isolated inside of the knee, it almost doesn't matter if you have arthritis under your kneecap, and the theory there is when you realign that crooked knee, it offloads that kneecap. And I've got a couple of patients, so some of them are active coaches up in the Lindale area, and uh, they've got 
arthritis underneath their kneecap, and when we've done that, they're not they're not having any pain with that. Uh, but when held to that, uh, held to those strict uh, indications, that uh, you can get a good long-term relief from here. So this is a uh, bearing, this plastic piece. Unlike remember, I told you when I was in uh, medical school, I got to knock that piece in with a hammer. Those actually mechanically lock into those uh, bearing. This is a free-floating piece. It actually fits in when you balance that knee. It actually has a concave base here that fits the curvature of the femur, and it slides along uh, this direction, flat back and forth. So with the Oxford knee, the overnight stay in the hospital, I don't send anybody to formal therapy after that. What we found is uh, therapists are so used to treating this, the stiffness that can happen after a full total knee that they get really aggressive. You can actually cause a lot of inflammation, extra pain in patients um, with, uh, with a partial knee. So I ask patients, I want to make sure they, they, they have the, uh, the ability to do this hard rehab. I want them to be able to straighten their leg up and if they can bend it and walk, then they can probably do the therapy. Um, saw a guy back um, in Lindale yesterday. I did his knee eight days ago. Um, and uh, he was one of the, actually, he was one of the ones who wanted to have both of them done. So we did bilateral. I'll show you a video, hopefully, or at the end, of, uh, one of the first ones that did bilateral on. But he came walking in at eight days. Um, he had a little bit of swelling he was concerned about. And I always tell patients, I'd rather have you come in and have it be nothing than have you wish you'd come in and be something. Because with infections, those kind of things, you want to move quickly. The... Um, uh, he, he looked fine on his exam, and I'm going to see him next week to do the, the regular workout. But what he had told me is that uh, he was feeling so good when he got home, he decided to start doing his two-mile walk again. And so he hasn't done any damage except cause himself a little bit more pain. But I've had folks out um, uh, trying to play golf within those first two weeks, and it's just one of those things where patients tell me that their, their knee feels like their normal knee again, whereas a, a full knee replacement takes care of the pain, but there's a mechanical type of symptom. Uh, smaller incision, uh, people will often ask me how big is the incision going to be, I say big enough. Um, they just say, yeah, that's funny. Really, how big is it going to be? Uh, you know, usually it's about a four, a four uh, inch incision across the, the knee, a little oblique. You'll see a couple of those uh, on here in a minute. Um, but basically, I tell people, uh, incisions heal side to side, not end to end, so it doesn't really matter how long it is. Really, what we want to do is just enough so that we can see what we need to do. The nice thing about these incisions is it doesn't go up into the muscle or the tendon like we do on knee replacements. Um, and so that's why you get you get that motion back and less scarring the um, So it preserves the parts of your knee that are normal. Uh, basically, we're just doing a resurfacing, taking out the, the worn out parts. And with that, you get quicker return to motion, strength, and activity. Uh, so this is uh, this is a, uh, one of the first uh, bilaterals I did about three years ago. And this is he, he doesn't even remember this video being taken because this is immediately in the post-operative recovery period. So yeah, I can do it over here. Mm -hmm. So I'm asking him to uh, to raise his legs and bend his knees. Uh, independently, um, and he, he woke up about 10 minutes ago. Oh, so, and that's something I, I, I like to do right after, for one thing, to make sure it, it works. For me, but also show them that it works. And I, I use some, some pain medications that are, that are that are great. I'm using a different one than I use with him. The one that I have now is called Exporel, and um, it is um, held in, in a lysosomal suspension, is what it's called, a little fat block. Um, that that's that's been an amazing medication. I've used it over the last six months. I need to stick with orthopedics. I don't need to be a stockbroker. I was so excited about it. I bought some of the stock at the highest price it's ever been. <laughs> we're down about 15%. Right now. But Liz, my wife said, you better not sell it. You better hang on to that. <laughs> it's a loss now. Anyway, so. But what it does is it, it's normally when we, when we numb you up, you go to the dentist, they numb your 
jaw up, you know, you bite your tongue the whole afternoon and it hurts the next week. But that numbing medicine wears off in an hour or two or so. This actually holds it in suspension in the soft tissues for about 72 hours, so three days. I'm not doing any nerve blocks on any of my total knee replacements, uh, which really improves um, patients' ability. I mean, they can move their leg right away. They don't have any muscle blockade, so it lowers the risk for falls. We've had some falls uh, from those kind of things. You can get fractures around there. That's not a fun thing to, to you know, I operate on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Tuesdays, Thursdays, I'm out at the outpatient center. You get a phone call about 10.30 in the morning. Ms. Smith fell, get an x-ray, and you see she's broken her femur. You're going back to surgery two days afterwards. Nobody's happy about that. Um, but that Expirel has helped with that. I use it really in hip replacements. I do try to learn from my patients. Uh, the reason I started going away from the spinal injections for hip replacements is do a great job with pain, but there, sometimes it can take a long time to put the injection in. It can be difficult to, uh, to get good placement. Um, there's all kinds of, you know, any extra thing you add, there's potential for other complications. And so this patient had a, a, a neuromorph spinal about two years ago when I did her right hip. And she had some complications from that, I had to stay in the intensive care unit for some breeding. She was never in trouble, but that certainly got her attention. When she came back, she said, I don't want the spinal. I said, I think I understand why. So I used a, a different type of injection. She actually, instead of going home in three days, went home in two days after that one from her other hip replacement. So I said, well, this, this probably can work for more than just her. So now this other medication, uh, hip replacement I did last week, um, I called him for a separate issue. Um, and uh, he said, my, my hip just now started hurting. This was on Monday. So it's, it's, I don't think it lasted that long. I think his hip hurt so bad that he felt so, so much better. You might clicking inside there. So this is a two week follow up uh, in the office. Um, yeah, I took both of them, if you will. You can see, this is the youngest patient I've ever done. That's her son. All right. Sitting over there. He's as amazed as I am. <laughs> right, so she's walking in two weeks down the hallway there. And this is her range of motion at uh, thir uh, that's in Lindell, so that was 15 days uh, after surgery. So she was 38 at that time. So that's the youngest I've done. I've done 83 is the oldest. The nice thing about this, this implant is it's, it's uh, age, weight, those are not indicators of who to do these. It's basically, if you fit those criteria on correctable alignment, isolated disease, intact ligaments, then you should be able to fall into that uh, place. So with conservative, non-surgical options no longer help to relieve pain and arthritis, joint replacements are proven beneficial and long-lasting option. But don't tear down the whole house if you only need a small remodel. So you'll click those two. This is that guy after uh, both of his knees. But he's getting full extension on that uh, right one, oh, and a little short on the left. But uh, he's walking up and down uh, the hallway at uh, 13 days. I must mean it's a Monday. Uh, it's 15 <laughs> days for him there. So. Um, you know, all of these things, there are risk and benefits with, with surgery. Um, you know, blood clot, infection, um, bleeding, the loosening of implants. Of these, I've had uh, two that have had to have, to been, have, had to have been revised. One for infection and one for dislocating the implant. Okay, remember that piece just slides back and forth. That piece, uh, this sh this uh, shows me the integrity, the need for the integrity of that anterior cruciate ligament. Of course, I was out of town. I think I was out of town when the infection happened too. So <laughs> I try not to leave town, but when I I need to come back because you never know it's going to be waiting for me. But uh, I came back and he had dislocated his implant. Uh, he was actually one I did bilaterals on too. The other one today, I hate to say this, but today is functioning great. Uh, but the other side uh, took an X-ray, and that little plastic piece it doesn't. There's no doesn't look like there's a metal in it, but there's a marker in there, uh, so you can see it if something happens to it. And it was sitting and floating in front of his knee. And so we went back, and I was thinking, well, I wonder if I put one that's in too small. So yeah, you weren't going to get anything bigger in than the one that he had. I looked at his anterior cruciate ligament and it had, had ruptured. Now, either um, he got back pretty aggressive too, um, but either it ruptured after surgery or one of those things that I didn't recognize at the time that it was 
uh, not as confident as I thought it was. Regardless, uh, he went back to have a revision uh, surgery uh, and did well after that. What I have found on those two occasions is that, you know, because this is a re resurfacing procedure, we're not taking away a lot of bone. We do save most of the other bone. So converting that over to a, uh, a full uh, total knee implant um, is uh, as straightforward as something like that can be. So um, that's been encouraging, you know. If doing this was something that only got people five years down the road, you know, then you kind of wonder whether that's that's what we need to do. But really, the goal in my hands is that this is a procedure that, that lasts a long, long time. Um, but when it doesn't, it's not like we've really had a big problem. Now we've got no bone. We've got to just basically do a uh, a big remodel. You know, just transplant the whole end of the femur with the metal. It's basically most of the time using just normal uh, total knee replacement parts. So don't tear down the whole house if you only need a small. So that's uh, I'm longer than I wanted to speak. Probably. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I really enjoy the procedure. Uh, we have a disc uh, that you're welcome to pick up on your way out. Um, it was always available on YouTube, it still is, but it's easier than writing down that address every time. So I've had the department make up these discs, and they should work in most standard DVD players. Um, it's about a five minute um, a discussion. It really goes over all the indications I've talked about. It has some live surgery uh, pictures in there, um, so beware, I think it's around a minute, two and a half. Um, but uh, they are, you'll see the size of the incision, my hands on there, and so you can kind of gauge how, how big those are, uh, but uh, still have not done this on an outpatient basis. Um, really need. Uh, I had one patient. Oh, this is a good another point. I had one patient that I had uh, scheduled to do on outpatient, but everybody that goes to surgery for this procedure gets consented by permit to have a knee full knee replacement done because I don't want to get in there and then find out that either that you do have arthritis in the other side of the knee or you've got a, a ligament that's incompetent uh, and then just close it up. So we're either going to do a partial or a full. And there have been two patients in my practice that went to sleep, crossing their legs and their fingers, hoping for a partial knee and woke up with a total knee. Obviously disappointed in the short term about that, but they both to date have done very well because that's the implant that they, they needed. It was the solution for the problem they had. Uh, and so uh, everybody that has this as an option has that on their consent. All right, my mouth's dry, so I'm done. Yes, yes ma'am. Well, 17 years ago, I had the total replacement and one knee to limp. Then I was told to wait a year because this one needed to be replaced. This was 17 years ago, and I was given the rooster count for the doctor's time. And this is the year. Uh, sure. And he says, I have the. <clears throat> Since then, of course, I have two hips, the shoulder, and a lot of other stuff. And I'm 80 years old. And I've lost the weight and done everything that's been told Would I still be a candidate, or would I still have to have the total replacement? That would, uh, a lot of that would have to do with what your x ray looks like. So the question is she's had one knee replaced 17 years ago. Um, the other knee has been told she needed to wait a year to have the knee replaced. Uh, but she's uh, finagled her way out of that for the last uh, 15, 17 so, uh, years. That That's good. Yeah, she's babied it. She's had a lot of the treatments we've talked about. But, no, so but, her, I, but I'm on my feet Yeah, and she still wants to stay active. So her question is, is she a candidate? So, uh, you know, it's got tongue in cheek. Everybody's a candidate until proven otherwise. But, uh, <laughs> but I, don't want, to prove, I don't want the tool. Right, right. But to prove it otherwise, you would need to have. Uh, an X ray and the stress view, as well as uh, well, the evaluation. I told you three years ago that I needed the total. Okay. I don't know that if, if he does this or is it just you or. It's just me right now. Okay. Okay. Um, he would refer me to you, I'm sure. We're getting along okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, he told me he didn't think that the, uh, he would come and work when he first did it. And it did for two years, so I mean, yeah. it doesn't work anymore. Did that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Sure. I know this is pretty quick in, in the light, but uh, driving. Yes. Now, with the total. Oh, yeah. Wild, but, uh, 
Yeah, I, I really tell patients, you know, let it tell you what you can do. So the question is, I, I guess, how quick can you drive? Because his experience has been, has been with a knee replacement, you're not quite, quite giving your freedom right away. Uh, so how quick can I have my freedom back? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, <laughs> and my wife says to do the other stuff around here. You need to do. All right, right. So the question is for his wife. Uh, but yeah, um, you know, as soon as you feel comfortable and safe to do that, uh, yeah, I really, um, it's one of those things that it seems almost too good to be true. Um, so you better start asking more questions. But, but really, uh, usually I can count on people being sore enough in the first week or two to really kind of limit themselves. But um, it really, I'm not getting into the muscle, so you know, all of that strength should be there. Just that's the stuff. difference in the pain levels from oh yeah, the total replacement in, in the partial. Right. Are you, are you asking what the difference is, or are you just saying? Yeah, well, the total replacement is pretty painful. <laughs> yeah, so you told me. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Can, does, can arthritis in the hip cause problems with the knee? That's a good question. Uh, can arthritis in the hip cause problems in the knee? Uh, it can, and, and actually I've taken care of some patients that come in for knee pain saying, my knee is killing me, my knee is killing me. Examine it, it moves pretty well. Uh, big x-ray, it actually doesn't look too bad, really. Um, look at their birthday. And, uh, but then, you know, then we kind of do a full exam and move their hips around. The left one moves great, but the right one inside where the knee hurts, doesn't really do it all. So we take an x-ray of the pelvis, and now they've got pretty significant arthritis there. So limitation in one, one joint affects the joints around it. That's a pretty, pretty strong teaching. I don't do any spine surgery, but you know, whenever you have a, a spine fusion, your body's going to find motion someplace. Or foot fusion, ankle fusion, that's why you get transfer arthritis. You get arthritis in other joints adjacent to those joints um, that aren't moving as well, because your body's going to move one way or the other. We, we don't want to be uh, static. So to move, your body's going to find ways to move. So if one joint is locked up, then yeah, you can get transfer pain then. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. I've got um, two sons that live in Dallas. Yes. They keep seeing these full page ads in the Dallas Morning News. And they say, Dad, you need to come to Dallas. And I tell them, no, I can get done what I need in time. Is there any kind of a burial thing going on in that? <laughs> <laughs> they have bigger budgets <laughs> than we do. I don't think there are any miracles anywhere. I, I do, you know, I get that. It, we all laugh, but I get that question asked honestly at least uh, two or three times a month. You know, is there basically with the words, is there anything new? And, uh, and we've talked about really all the solutions that there are uh, for arthritis tonight. So this comes as close uh, as I know of being a, um, a solution for for arthritis without the full meal deal. But there are some very narrow indications for that. Yes, sir. Any limitations on activities, uh, exercises, or anything anybody's doing after a functional meal? Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll ask you, we don't want uh, uh, high impact kind of jumping, kind of plyometric things. Racquetball probably is getting, uh, although I do have some tennis players um, that uh, they're probably not very good, but they, uh, <laughs> they are playing with that. But really, what we have to realize is that this is an interface between the bone, the bone, cement, and metal. Okay, only one of those is you. The other two are, are foreign substances. And so there is some shear stress across that. But the nice thing about this implant is that the knee should be returned more to normal um, uh, kinematic function. So the ligament should work better. So um, I have I got a trip with a guy here. I see him every Sunday. And I had a knee replacement on him about six years ago. He's still playing league softball. Say it's not bothering him. And I keep telling him, I told you not to, and he'll be back one day. He keeps proving me wrong. But, um, you know, the implants that we use, particularly the, the plastic 
that's really where most of the technology is driven now. Is how how low can we get that wear rate down? Uh, because you're going to wear two substance stuff. That's why we have to keep replacing tires. Okay, that stuff wears down. Uh, same thing with this plastic. But the, the lower wear rates that we can get, the longer those impacts. Because that plastic has to go someplace. It, it, it doesn't just kind of waltz up off a nice little place. It actually seeks out the uh, the bony interfaces between the cement and the metal. So the less impact activity we can do, the less wear rates we're going to have. So um, could you do it? You could do it. Um, it's probably going to lessen the life of that. We would probably be happier with lower impact activities. Um, you know, no big rollerblades anymore, but that's, uh, you know. <laughs> So those kind of things, or, or uh, certainly, uh, you know, biking. Um, I guess if you could, you come up with a new game: two bikes and a and a paddle in, in, a, in a small room. There's probably other problems with that. But uh, uh, and then you, you said so wrapped up all. You said something else: martial arts. Martial arts. Yeah, I, I probably wouldn't have a problem with the martial arts part of it. Yeah. I've got a patient, another bilateral. I really don't do that very that many bilateral, but it seems to be in the crazier in my population. So this guy was a, and I'm going to call chaplain crazy, but um, he uh, he's a chaplain in the army, um, and uh, he just couldn't do what he needed to do, and he was uh, going to be deployed over to Afghanistan. And so uh, he was actually sent to me from um, a surgeon in another group in town. Um, and so I, I do get, get uh, referrals from outside of my group as well. Um, and so with that, uh, we ended up talking through everything. He was a candidate. We did those. And he got deployed to Afghanistan about um, a year and a half ago. He was there for about nine months. I saw him back, I'm going to say three months, but time flies, probably six months ago. Um, and he, he said he did fine. I told him, to your point, I, he said, can I run? I said, where you're going, there may be times you need to run. <laughs> I don't want to be responsible for you not having run. So if those instances arrive, feel free to run. Uh, but he, he did find said there was some times he had to run. But uh, uh, his x-rays in a year and a half, instead of one year because he was deployed when I was going to see him, were doing fine. His range of motion was fine. He was, he was happy with it. Uh, he, bought me, he brought me back one of those uh, hats, those bush Afghanis wear, you know. Uh, so my kids enjoyed wearing that for <laughs> Any other questions? I thought there may be one of here. Yes, sir. Do you do any surgery to put for a hospital? No, I do not. Well, that's what I was wondering. I okay. had some friends from the doctor's team there, and I did fix the night, and they tested with the results. Okay, yeah. I, um, I have a clinic on Wednesday mornings at Linday, okay. um, but I don't. Go all the way up, up there. Okay. I do get patients down from all those areas. But yeah, we we do have started a clinic up there with uh, a, a couple of our partners uh, over the last six, twelve months, I think. Yes, sir. Five years ago, they then uh, took some chips out of my knee. They told me then I should have had a partial. Okay. Now they tell me it's bone on bone. That's a good point. So five years ago, he had an arthroscopic procedure. We saw that's the camera procedure. They took chips out of his knee, told him he probably should have had a knee replacement, a partial knee replacement at that time. But now they're telling him he needs his whole knee replaced. Um, and that may may be the case. Um, to identify whether you're still can for this, you need the stress X-ray and those kind of things. But the natural history of a lot of these arthritis, the bone leg is the most common. Sometimes the knee goes the other way. That's another instance. But the natural history is you get this wear over here, and then as you lose that space, you start to get these bone spurs. And this is the McCown theory. It's not really written anywhere else. But those bone spurs, I think, really are kind of elbow curve feelers that are put out uh, to really try to tension those ligaments because your knee gets sloppy as it wears out. And if you get more tension on those ligaments, then you can kind of feel more stable. But part of what those ligaments do as you move your knee through the range of motion is it can act like a knife blade probably ends up cutting that ACL ligament. And then you don't have that important ligament for the partial knee. And then that's when you get the wall wrapped around and, it, and that starts to wear out the other parts of it. Yes, sir. On your x-rays there, where is the fluid in the knee? What part of the hip plane in the operation? Where is the fluid? Yeah. Okay, let's go back to 
Here we go. Right. So this is the uh, joint capsule and the ligament on the side here. So this is all an open potential space here. So when we do the injections, we go in where we put the camera in. So the question is, where is all the fluid that you've heard gets drained off and those kind of things? It actually is made by the cells that line that knee. And they, it makes fluid when there's inflammation around. Uh, and what it's trying to do is lubricate the knee to get it moving better. But if it's inflammatory, it causes pain. And that, that, that doesn't feel good. So that's why we drain the knee um, and sometimes put cortisone in to decrease that. But that's where it lives. It actually is made by the lining of the knee joint all the way around. And then, um, and, and sometimes we will clean out all of that lining, um, but your body will remake that. Your body will remake the bursa. We will take them out and reverse side and stuff. The body is always about trying to regenerate. No, there's always a little bit of fluid. If you look on any normal MRI, uh, there'll be some fluid there. Um, it's just because uh, you need that to lubricate. Actually, the cartilage doesn't have any blood flow to it. It gets its uh, uh, nutrients from the fluid itself. Um, so that's why if your fluid is good or normal, so sometimes we use the synvisc injections, those, uh, those will help to start to be making normal fluid or non arthritic fluid. That can be healthier for the cartilage. Yes? What company manufactures this particular It's an Oxford knee by Biomet. B I O M E T. I don't have it on there, but that's their thing. B I O M E T. Yes, ma'am. When you do a total knee replacement, are they all the same size? I mean, do you just get one off the shelf? Or do you <laughs> we do get it off the shelf, but they come in different sizes. Okay. Yeah. So there is a... There is right, yeah. Size. We actually uh, use a, a computer um, mm -hmm. to make the resections, to, to make the bone cuts on a total knee replacement. Do you have a guy knee and a girl knee? Well, Some are they? <laughs> we are designed differently. Exactly. And I have heard years back that some women in fit, this is total knee replacement with the larger one designed specifically for a male. But and they've had some, some problems from but do they design these male and female? Male and female, he created them. That's a uh, that's God. Uh, no, that's a good question. Uh, there are, my my quick take on that is a lot of that is like the full page ads in Dallas. Okay. I think, well, do you determine that after you get into surgery? Well, the, okay, the size is yes, we determine that. Yeah, we've got uh, different sizes up and down. That, both the tibia, from small to big, paper mm -hmm. big to small. Yeah, so we, we make it match you. But for the gender specific type, type of thing, uh, my gut feeling after 12 years of this is that for the most part, that, that's a marketing issue. Uh, there is some, some difference uh, in side to side. The main thing is that you don't want a lot of overhang of that metal because that will start rubbing on the collateral. Wheel. But um, the implant that I use is uh, for total knees, and so I'm not tied to a specific company. I use this because I think it's the best partial knee. I use uh, a striker for total knee replacements um, because it, it actually was designed as um, one of the uh, it actually came out with studies based on male and female needs. Um, but the other one is a Zimmer. Uh, but I tell patients, it'll be the last thing I say and then we'll finish up. But, uh, but I, I tell patients about the joint replacement because it'll always, not always, it'll come up often, you know, is the implant you're using, has it been recalled? Something like that. And so I'll step back and I'll say, first of all, no. But then we have to when we see those commercials, it looks like there's some real smart attorney that went out and dug through all this stuff and figured it out and found this, this problem. Let me just ask this question, and your gut, gut check answer will be the right one. What, these companies make these implants, what is their number one thing they're trying to do? Yeah. Sell them, make money, right? Okay. It's not in their best interest, this would be the, the worst thing I say, to put crap out, okay? <laughs> If you start putting crap out, you're going to have crappy results, okay? And then you're not going to be selling implants. So that's counterintuitive to their business model, okay? What kind of medicine are you 
This uh, this is a, um, a cobalt chloride. It's an alloy. Okay. Right, right. The um, but all these these implants, their their aim is to their bottom line. Okay. So all of these recalls that you see advertised by attorneys, they're actually recalls that were generated by that company. They found that there have been some reports with their product. And they, they don't want that out there on the market. Well, just because there's a recall also doesn't mean that all that has to be ripped out as well. So that, that was a good question. Do we have a citation? Can I get you a call? Oh, sure. Yeah. You're blaming me. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, so uh, you tell me what we're doing here. All right, you just call the names, I'll get it out. All right, Leah Julia Hurley. And uh, Judy, is that Albrighton? Albrighton. Okay. You sure, you're not a surgeon? <laughs> oh no. I know why you have me. <laughs> It's a Who lives at 4122 Sagemont? <laughs> no, sir. Yeah, see? I couldn't do that. I was even. Oh, I was reading it backwards. Okay, that's true. I had first name, last name. L.A. Matthew. All right, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I don't know about this philosophy guy. <laughs> Very awesome. Uh oh. You must have made him mad. <laughs> no, I made him happy. <laughs> Sheila Nichols. Sue Burns, right down the road. Wanda Ely. This is the last one. I'll send that to Okay. And uh, Susan Trevardo. All right. And if I can ask one question, um, did anybody we we changed up the way we sent out our invitations this month? We had a big email blast. Did anybody learn about this other than email? On the way out, if you don't mind, will you tell me how you heard about it? Great. Thank you. Well, thank you all very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.